A reading from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter starting with the ninth verse. About that time Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. While he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw heaven splitting open in the Spirit like a dove coming down on him. And there was a voice from heaven, You are my Son, whom I dearly love, and you I find happiness. At once the Spirit forced Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan. He was among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Experience was light growing up, but when I hit the age of 17 or 18, and then on into my college years, we would play a game, my friends and I, especially when it came to traveling, or, or when it came to traveling and jumping in a car with each other, we would always want to be the first to call what? Shotgun. All right. You're familiar with that, right? Now, for me, being tall and having long legs, it was very ideal for me to want to call shotgun first because I needed to be up front. I did not need to be crammed up in the back of somebody's car. All right, so for my own experience, I wanted to, to be the first to call shotgun, and then for whatever reason, we would always call shotgun, and then we start running to the car. Like, it didn't make any sense, but anyways. I needed to be up front. I needed to be in that seat. I did a little bit of work this, this past week or, or previously about trying to figure out where that came from, and, and I'm sure that you're familiar with this, but, but if you're not, if you hadn't heard this before, I wondered where that came from. Like, why would we call shotgun? And this goes back to our stagecoach days, right? The days in which there was somebody driving the stagecoach and they would always be fearful that, that bandits or outlaws or even wild animals would attack the stagecoach, and so somebody would ride up front and he or she would carry a shotgun to shoot people. <laughs> I, raise the, I, I tell you this story, I share this story with you because I think it sheds a, just a tiny bit of light on, on our passage for today when we think about what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. We have this scene that I just shared with you from Mark in which the, Jesus comes to the Jordan and is baptized by John and as He comes up out of the water we hear this booming voice of, of God calling down, this is my Son with whom I'm well pleased. And then the, the, the dove breaks forth in the clouds or the, the, the Holy Spirit like the dove breaks forth. This is one image that um, I like. This is uh, an artist, Hiki. You got that image? There you go. Uh, this is a Chinese artist that, that does renditions of, of the different scenes in the Bible. He's one of our favorite artists at our home. And, and, and it just offers that image of the, the, the dove coming down. And, and most artists render it just like this, that there's a, a dove. I mean, we can look at our banners and you have the dove here. And, and there's a dove in the back banner back there. We have these and this is sort of part of what we understand is the Holy Spirit. And I'll admit to you that I've read this story so many times that I look over the word like a dove. That the Holy Spirit was like a dove. I've always thought, hey, it was just the Holy Spirit came in the bodily, in the bodily form of a dove. But it's like a dove. And so we don't really know what the Holy Spirit looked like, but we understand that it sort of hovered over this scene. If you were with us last week, and I'll remind you of this, that at creation, the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters before creation occurred. It was as if the, the, the Holy Spirit was just anticipating the, the, the new thing that was about to begin. I wonder if the Holy Spirit hovers above us. I mean, each and every day offers us an opportunity to, to enter into a new creation with God. And, and the Holy Spirit, I, I imagine, is, is hovering above us, waiting in baited anticipation for what we will be a part of with God's help each and every day. My hope and prayer is that, that the Holy Spirit is, is hovering above us as a church family, providing us direction and, and guidance as well. But that's not the only whole thing the Holy Spirit did in our story. The, the Holy Spirit, upon the, Jesus coming up out of the water, Mark tells us, and, and it's only in Mark that, that really demonstrates this, but, but Mark tells us that the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness or into the desert. The Holy Spirit drove 
Jesus into the wilderness. Why? I think, and we can speculate on the fact that, that maybe Jesus was getting ready to be prepared for what would come next. His ministry hadn't started at this point, and so the, the desert was this place of preparation for him to get him ready for what he would face in the three years that would follow. But this spirit driving Jesus in to the desert. And think, you've got to imagine that, that Jesus is, if, if Jesus is being driven, then that means that Jesus is riding shotgun, right? The Holy Spirit's got a hold and is, is taking him to a place that he may or may not want to go, but it, it is important for him for the step that would come next, for the steps that would follow. Now, we've often thought about the desert and, and like this, which is a place of, of starkness, of, of, of kind of uh, nothingness, if you will. Just a lot of rocks and, and sand and, and heat, right? I mean, this is sort of what the image that comes to mind. And, and, and if we go even further, then some of us probably think that the, the desert is the place of the devil because of what Jesus encountered there, the temptation that he would face. I want to challenge that thought this morning. I want to offer an alternative to say that maybe, just maybe, that the desert is not the place of, of death, of pain and suffering, the place of the devil. Instead, that the desert might just be a place that we find the Holy Spirit as well. I raise this because I believe, honestly, that, that some people in this room right now, and, and I know that and others, uh, are, are in deserts of their lives right now. They're in places that appear and feel dry. I know that when, in my own life, that at, at times I'll, I'll be spiritually dry after a, a couple of, of bad days, and, and, and it just feels like I'm all alone. But... If I understand this correctly, if the Holy Spirit is driving Jesus into the desert, my logical next step would be that the Holy Spirit doesn't just drop Jesus off and say, we'll see you in 40 days. But instead, the Holy Spirit resides with Him there. Almost as if the Holy Spirit is hovering above, waiting for what's going to come next. Waiting for the next great step. In creation. I also believe this, that the Holy Spirit is present because Jesus tells me the Holy Spirit is going to be present. In our story for today, Jesus tells us before the disciples are left by themselves, as He ascends to heaven one last time, as he, he departs from them one last time in the bodily, fleshly form that we know as Jesus Christ he promises them, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And if the Holy Spirit came upon them, then logically we down the line from them are also recipients of that same Holy Spirit. Now, this scene that we talk about is uh, the ascension of Christ. And Ascension Day is actually this coming Thursday. We've sort of moved it up a little bit. And, and traditionally, your, your friends in other churches will probably celebrate it uh, uh, next Sunday. So, so you've got a head start on them. You can go brag to them tonight or, or, or this week. But they'll celebrate it next Sunday. We, we moved it up just for this series. And, and this scene is often portrayed in, in several different artist renditions. This here is, is Rembrandt's interpretation of the ascension scene. If you can see that there, it's Jesus sort of being lifted up by these, well, in my impersonation, these are some scary looking baby angels or whatever those things are. Um, I think I was told they're cherubs. Um, apologize for those who like cherubs, but they, they're sort of lifting Jesus up in this scene. But you can see the disciples are down kind of gawking at, at Jesus as He rises up. This is one interpretation or one, one version of, of this story. This is the one, the second one is the one I like the most. This is by a German artist named Hans Suss von Kolmbach. Now, what our brother Hans, this painting, anytime I turn to it, it just makes me laugh, right? The choir can probably see it better than, than some of you can. But, but at the very top, all you can see is Jesus' feet. 
Like, that's it. And so I always just get a chuckle anytime I turn to this because I, it just makes me laugh. You just see Jesus' feet. Nothing else. But if we sit with it a few minutes, if you sit with it a few minutes, I, I think Hans gets it right in two very significant ways. First, I, I love the fact that the disciples are all looking up. Uh, even the female disciple that's there in the front that he paints into this picture, which I appreciate. It's not just the men, but, but the women are, are also there with Jesus. And they're all looking up, focusing on, on what they're seeing of Jesus going up into the clouds. And, and these two individuals come and walk amongst them. These two messengers of God, we also call them angels, come and, and they're significant. They're, they're, they're symbolized there in white. They're wearing the white robe. And, and they come, and, and, and you remember in the story, they sort of ask the disciples, why, why are you looking up? It's no longer time to look up. You need to turn outward and you need to start looking out at the world. See, I appreciate this because I really firmly believe that if we are using Jesus as our escape clause from this place, being earth, we're sort of missing out. Because if Jesus, the only importance that Jesus has for us is in order to, to get us out of here, to call us up into heaven one day, then that's going to make our lives fairly miserable while we're here on earth, if that's the only thing Jesus came for. And besides, which we go another step further, if that is the plan for us just to go up into heaven, then why in the world do we need the Holy Spirit? Why in the world would God send us the Holy Spirit to be here on earth with us if the only point that we have is for us to go from being here to up there and that's it? Remember the call that these disciples received was to no longer look up, but instead to start looking out. As if saying to the disciples, come, it is time for you to join in this kingdom of God work that I have for you. And this occurs in one significant way. You will be my witnesses to the world. Friends, this is the call that is placed on each and every one of your lives, not just mine as a pastor. I asked some of the guys this week, I said, are you comfortable with this language of calling? Uh, because all of us are called in some way, shape, or form, in some capacity. Our calling as disciples of Jesus Christ is to be witnesses with our very lives. And the way we do that is the second part of what Brother Hans gets right in this picture, in that we follow those little feet that we see of Jesus. We follow in Jesus' footsteps. We go the places where Jesus would have us to go, the very places that Jesus Himself went. We, we love the people that Jesus would have us to love, and, and those aren't the people we want to love, I can promise you that. We place a healing hand on those whom Christ would have us to heal. We are driven by that very same Spirit to places that will prepare us for the next step in our lives as we enter with God into the creative process. Allowing that Spirit to drive us to places we would rather not go ourselves or, or to do things that we would not think to do on our own. To drive us to places that go above and beyond even our own limitations and capabilities. Rest assured, friends, we, you and I, will be witnesses. We will be witnesses to something. Remember that, that that is not a command that is, is not a, a polite suggestion that Jesus gives. Jesus doesn't say, hey, in your free time, guys, if you could go and witness for me a little bit, I'd appreciate that. It, it, it's not a suggestion. This is a command that Jesus gives. You will be my witnesses. 
we will be witnesses. The only real question that we have to ask is what will, be, will we be witnesses to? What does your life witness to? I've told you before that, that children, as well as others, are much more inclined to see what you're passionate about, what you're passionate about, than they are to see what you believe. People will understand you more or will look to the things that you become passionate about, the things that, that kind of get your fire going in your belly, long before they will see and hear what you say with your mouth about what you believe. And so if you are, are passionate about, um, I don't know, Red Sox baseball, people will see that. If you are, are passionate about the plight of, of children in Africa, people will see that. If you are passionate about politics, oh, people will see that. <laughs> if you are passionate about sharing your life, why you do what you do, if you're passionate about helping other people to come to a, a better understanding of why we are here on this earth together, if you are, are passionate about making somebody's life just a little bit easier by giving of yourself, whether that's with your time, your energy, your effort, even just simply your prayers, people will notice That's what we call witnessing. So on this day, with this monumental task that we face before us, because let's acknowledge it's a pretty big task that, the, that Jesus gives us. I mean, this isn't, you know, go and, and, and run this quick errand for me. This is our, our lives that He's calling for. We gather together to remember. Anytime we start, it's always a good place to remember first why we do what we do and who we do it for. And so we gather together over this bread and over this cup and, and we will take it and we'll bless it and we'll break it and we'll share it together. And, and in a moment when we pray together, I'm going to call forth on that Holy Spirit to, to pour out upon us here, gathered here. Not, not just to, to, to do something crazy with this stuff down here, but the Holy Spirit to come down upon us. And through this remembrance, through this act of remembering what Jesus did for us, preparing us for the task at hand, for us to live our lives as faithful disciples, and for us to share our faith as well so that others will also grow in the power of the Holy Spirit and will experience the Holy Spirit's presence in their lives as well. It's a big task. Are you up for it? Because I can promise you, God is. Amen. Amen. Let's continue our worship now with the giving and the receiving of our...